I call this meeting of the Northeast Independent School District to order. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. The board will now adjourn into executive session pursuant to the following sections of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Texas Government Code Section 551.074 to discuss personnel or to hear complaints against personnel, and the time is 530. The board will now reconvene into open session and the time is 543. Item four, matters from executive session A, personnel including but not limited to administrative appointments pursuant to government code section 551.074. One, possible action regarding routine personnel including but not limited to administrative appointments. A, assistant principal of Churchill High School. Do I have a motion to approve as discussed in executive session? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hillier. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Byer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Item B, Assistant Principal at MacArthur High School. Do I have a motion to approve as discussed in executive session? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Byer. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Item C, Senior Director of Human Resources. Do I have a motion to approve as discussed in executive session? So, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Byer. Do I have a second? Yes, second. Uh, Ms. Villarreal, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. Item five, presentation A, budget study session number two. Mr. Villarreal. Uh, <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Oh. oh. Sorry, I always forget that we have um, people signed up to speak, so we're going to do that first. Um, at this time, the board will receive comments from those individuals who signed up to speak to this specific agenda item. Speakers will be called up to speak in the order in which they appear on the sign-in sheet and to the item that they signed up to speak to. Speakers should limit their comments to the specific agenda item for which they signed up. Please remember that this is a business meeting of the board. Any person or group engaging in outbursts of any kind causing a disruption to the meeting will be warned and if they persist will be removed from the meeting. This is to ensure that all speakers have an opportunity to make comments without interruption and that the board members are able to pay full attention to speakers without any distractions. Mrs. Huey. Number one. I think we're going to do all of them beforehand. I'd rather go afterwards. So, um, lose his ability to speak. Well, you've given your time, so it's your choice. It's, it's you've given him the time to speak. It's, if he's not going to take it. Yeah. If if you don't wish to speak now, then you will not be able to speak after the presentation. Fine. Okay. Um, Ms. Huey. Number two. Right there. Uh, my name is Carol Varela. I've been a bus assistant for eight years at TNT, and uh, I'd like to discuss the salary options because it seems like we don't ever get any funds coming in. We do a, I, my personal opinion, we do a perfect job. We transport children back and forth safely in the most safe manner we can possibly do, and yet it's a shame that any other place Flipping burgers, any other place pays more than what we do. And we do, I do take my job very seriously. I love it and I enjoy the kids. And I don't do it, I can't say I don't do it for the money because I do, but I do it mainly because I do love it and because I enjoy the children. And it's a shame that we can, you all can never find the funds to give us because you buy things that don't really make any sense to us. When y'all had the stop signs that didn't work out. When you have that machine that's supposed to read cards, doesn't work out. Money that goes to other things besides the kids or to us because we do transport these, these children and we do do it as safely and as wonderful as possible. I have had some very good remarks regarding kids that I've gotten to talk that didn't ever talk before. So that's why I enjoy it. And I just find it a shame that all these years and we still can't get a, a raise. Thank you. 
Number three. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Christina Bonifacio. I'm also, um, I also go from TNT. And the reason I'm here is because as I would like to echo what number two had said about our salaries. You know, um, <clears throat> we, we were just, we would like to be able to be represented in the budget because we feel like our job is also as important as educators and other um, uh, jobs in NEISD. And we want to be able to represent and be proud of what we're doing and to have, you know, compensated where we can show a little bit of dignity in what we do. Um, I, can, I can't speak for the others. I'm retired Air Force, so I do this because I like to do service. But sometimes being in the office and and listening to other people that work there, drivers and assistants alike, they do this job and that's their only job. And knowing that other school districts uh, are able to pay their, um, their employees in the transportation area, whereas we, ours is one of the lowest. I was just pleading to the board that you can look at this one so that we can have some pride in what we do and compensated for what we're doing. Thank you. Number four. My name is John Lester. Um, I'm uh, sorry, that's not, that's not the name on her. She has me take her number. You have to sign up on the sign-in sheet if you want to speak. Okay. Sorry. Number five. Good afternoon, board members, Dr. Micah, others. My name is Scott Willis. I'm a teacher at Roosevelt High School. I teach in the math department. And let's talk about budgets and salaries. Why are we all here? What is NEISD? NEISD is a school district. Anything that isn't in furtherance of our mission statement to challenge and encourage each student to achieve and demonstrate academic excellence, technical skills, and responsible citizenship is a waste. I've heard rumors that the board is going to talk about being landlocked and oh, whoa, our budget is so tight and it is oh this and oh that. No, it's not time for that. You need to start looking at this as a crisis. Texas is short 8,000 teachers. We're the third lowest paid teachers in the district, in Bear County. So when you get a pool of 20 people, you're gonna get the 18th most qualified. You might be able to retain some teachers. Oh, but why would a teacher stay here? Let's talk about budget a little bit. Let's talk about a budget for a typical teacher that's here for $50,000 a year. We know that the Federal Reserve Bank holds inflation at 2.5% per year. That means my $50,000 salary loses $1,250 worth of buying power every year. So in the six years that I've been here at NEISD, I now make $54,740. This is the first year that I'll make as much, or actually more than I made the first year I worked here. Unfortunately, I've lost $1,250 in six years, $7,500 in spending power. So now I'm down to making $42,500. Oh, wait, you took away a stipend that I got. You were the only district in the county or in the county that took away stipends. Everyone else grandfathered stipends in. You cut my salary 4% the first three years that I worked here by taking a $2,000 stipend away. So now I'm in the hole about $10,000. So instead of making 54, I'm really making about 44. You guys have come back out of that a little over $3,000 in those six years. That doesn't cover three years worth of inflation. Teachers can't continue to work in a hole. You've got to start doing some things that everybody else does. Who in this room here, which one of you that has been outside, oops, pardon, been outside the school district, worked for a year and didn't get a raise? 
where in the federal government or the state government do people work year after year and not get a step increase? People you're hiring now with six years of experience are going to make $1,200 more next year than I will make staying at NEISD because you guys don't do step increases either. Sir, that's your time. Thank you. Number six. Good evening, Ms. Grunt. Short people. <laughs> Good evening, Ms. Grona, uh, board members. Uh, my name is Adonis Sherman, and I'm the ex officio or past president for the Northeast Education Association. I'm speaking to you tonight about salary proposals. The Northeast Education Association has submitted a comprehensive salary proposal for next year. In the past few months, numerous districts have, have rewarded their teachers with substantial pay raises. I sincerely hope that. This will not be like previous years where we were rewarded a 2% from the midpoint. If that's the case, Northeast will continue to hemorrhage excellent teachers and staff and maybe still wonder why. Thank you. Number seven. President Grona, <clears throat> members of the board, Dr. Micah, my name is Tom Cummins and I'm representing Northeast AFT. As we had addressed previously with you, there's a problem throughout the state with teachers retiring early or quitting the profession. Northeast is not immune to this movement. In fact, several of our members for, have quit for one of those two reasons, early retirement or we're getting out of the profession. Teachers cite two main reasons for leaving the profession. The first is an unreasonable, unsustainable teacher workload for many. The situation must be reviewed and acted on, but since this is a budget meeting, I will address the second issue tonight, which is integral to retaining and attracting the best teachers, and that is pay and benefits. According to the Economic Policy Institute, Texas teachers are paid 20% less than their college graduate peers and other professions. And the stresses on teachers are currently much higher than most other professions. Increasing pay and benefits is essential. For teachers, librarians, nurses, counselors, and other non-administrative professionals, we propose an 8% increase with a $2,000 retention supplement other earnings should be adjusted accordingly also. For hourly employees, we ask for a $15 starting pay with each employee's pay family increased proportionately so there is no compression. This results in a varying percentage increases for those employees. We also request a $2,000 retention supplement for them also. For health insurance, we request no increase to employees and no lessening of benefits. These pay figures are in line with what some districts have already adopted for next school year. Please act to make NEISD a leader in pay and benefits, as well as ensuring quality employees are attracted and retained. Thank you for your consideration of our proposals. Number eight, number nine, and number 10 were left blank, so we'll go to number 11. Good evening. I am Margarita Cordova. I'm a taxpayer, and my daughter is a school teacher with NEISD. She's been uh, at CERNA for 23 years now and she's pre-K. So every week she has a chore of taking all the blankets home and washing them. Her time, her expense. Um, also all the, all the items that she needs to keep the class going. Um, the Crayolas, the books, um, the connection that she has with the kids is uh, amazing. During COVID, um, her and her assistant would dress as um, cute characters, 
and they went to their houses, knocked on the doors, gave them all kinds of gifts, and um, that's a lot. That's very giving of her. Um, so I'm gonna keep it short. I would like to demand um, a substantial increase for these educators that, that just give and give, and I don't think they ever have enough to pay the bills, you know, to take care of their families, to do whatever they want to do. So that's my statement. I hope you all listen. And that's all that I've signed up. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now, Mr. Villarreal. <clears throat> yes. Yes, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Mike, executive staff, and guests. I call on Susie Lackhorn, our executive director of finance and accounting, to present this uh, budget study session. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, <clears throat> last week, uh, last week, last week was graduation. Week before that, um, we had budget study session number one, and so we've gotten that out of the way. After tonight, we'll have budget study session number three on June 20th. Um, next week will be the regular June board meeting. And so at that meeting, we'll cover debt service, do final updates, any additional compensation discussion that we need to have, and then we'll do a really deep, detailed dive into what the budget looks like that you're going to adopt on Thursday, June 23rd. Um, hopefully, you've all made plans to, to be here that night as we need a quorum to adopt. I only say it 200 times every year. All right, so let's look at our agenda for tonight. We're gonna recap budget study session number one. We'll talk about our staffing, compensation, health insurance, our additional allocation requests, and general. we'll sum up everything with what all that, how it impacts the general fund. So budget study session number one, we talked about how increased property values do not increase our overall revenue. So when we get that extra funding because values went up, the state just reduces what they contribute to us. So even though homeowners are now paying a, a bigger check, um, the district itself is not seeing additional funds. So that 2.5% limitation on overall tax collections um, is also not individual, that's district-wide, so some homeowners will see larger increases, and we definitely, uh, most homeowners saw, saw considerably larger increases this year. So, um, average daily attendance has not returned to our pre-pandemic level, and last time we talked about how important attendance is in our funding. So every time we lose a percent in attendance, um, that's about $7 million in revenue. And so right now we are sitting um, lower than what we had prior to uh, the pandemic. Additionally, we talked about, we did some comparisons with other districts and how they have additional revenue or larger buckets than we do. And um, we talked about school nutrition and how we no longer get to feed everybody for free next year, but we are increasing our CEP sites, so some campuses will get to continue. All right, so let's talk about staffing. Last time, we talked about the importance of enrollment and what role it plays in revenue. Today, we're gonna to talk about the important role enrollment plays in staffing. So every spring, um, once we've prepared enrollment projections, then we're able to project how many teachers are needed and all the other staff associated with the campuses. So these enrollment projections help, uh, help drive our staffing levels. So let's take a look. Since we are losing students, um, that means we will need to lose, we don't need as many teachers as we did the year before. So for next year, we will reduce teaching. FTE stands for full-time equivalent so um, sorry for using the abbreviation over and over again, but it is the easiest way to describe because you may have some teachers working half time and, and filling a, a full row. So, so we'll lose 63 uh, and save $4.3 million. Um, at the elementary level, that'll be six teachers. Um, but bear in mind that depending on where kids show up, since we're required to staff 22 to one, if a bunch of kids show up somewhere that we hadn't expected, then we may need to add staff. 
And each year in the budget, we have a contingency built ready so that we can hire teachers right off the bat instead of coming to you each time we need to increase the budget to hire additional teachers. So we'll, we use that $3 million um, to hire any teachers we need when we go over 22 to 1 in the, in the fall. At middle school and high school, we'll see larger reductions, 34 and 23. And just a reminder here at the bottom, this is the difference uh, our 21, 22 enrollment was compared to our projection. Um, when we talked back in March, we talked about how optimistic we were, how we were recovering and getting more students, and then the Delta variant came around, and we, we saw a, a lot of people choose not to come back to school um, in, in the fall of 21. So next year, we're projecting to be 1,200 students fewer than our October snapshot of the current year. So that drives the reduction in our teaching FTEs. Also impacted are non-teaching professionals. Um, we'll reduce for 25 and a half FTEs and save 2.1 million. Um, at the elementary, that is four, um, four and a half counts, counselors offset by the addition of an, uh, half of a family specialist. We'll lose 7.7 .7 at the middle school. Um, two assistant principals, two counselors. Four and a half stand counselors will actually just be changing funding source, so they'll come off of the general fund budget and onto a Title IV budget, and then they'll add a .8 family specialist. At high school, a 3.8 FTE reduction, two assistant principals, two counselors. Those stand counselors are gonna move to Title, um, 1.3 family specialist and a SPED administrator. At the campus assistant level, um, we're actually going to need to add so 31 additional FTEs for campus assistance will cost us 900,000 and offset some of the savings we were getting from the others. Um, this is primarily special ed education assistance and pre-K assistance. And so uh, instead of reading every number on the slide, you can see there it's 21 at elementary, four at middle and six at high school. All right, so let's talk about compensation now. Now that we know how many staff members we'll have, let's talk about what they get paid. Over the last 10 years, this is our pay raise history. So um, earlier in the teens, we were pretty consistent with um, picking flat percentages for groups. Um, we started e even further back, it was always one percentage across the board for everybody. Then we started changing it up and um, giving higher rates to our hourly employees. And then throughout the years, um, <clears throat> we've changed our mindset some. And so last year was a very different plan than what we've had in the past. And so we had a range of percentages for different groups. And then we did targeted adjustments for specific groups that um, we, we either had a hard time to fill or their pay was more out of line than, than other groups. And then we were also able to leverage ESSER funds last year to do a 1% fall retention and a 1% spring retention. So now let's look at how much a general compensation package costs. Now, before we get too excited about some of these numbers, I, I wanna remind you that for next year, for the current year and for next year, we have a lot of staff being um, paid for by ESSER funds. And so their raises won't cost the general fund money. And so when we are tallying this cost, um, it would be higher if we had those, all those teachers back in the general fund, just so bear in mind. So um, if, if this was a normal year, all of these numbers would be slightly higher. And, and Susie, just, yes. just to uh, remind you all, in 2013 and 14, we were at 68,000 kids. We're projecting to be at 58,000. So we've lost 10,000 kids. And remember, we do get uh, money for enrollment. So with the enrollment being down and with our, uh, what do you call it, uh, average daily attendance being down, that's what's really been driving where our revenues have been flat. They were already flat from 2009 to 2019 because of all the changes that occurred. 2019, House Bill 3 gave us a little bit more money. That was where we were able to uh, give a little bit more and in raises. But 
just as a reminder, what we learned on the first budget study session, our revenues are flat. And when we lose kids, we're losing revenue. Expenses are the same. They're, they're not being reduced. We're reducing a few teachers here and there and a few staff, but expenses are going up and our revenues are, are staying. So I just wanted to remind everyone that we went from 68,000 kids to 58,000 kids in a matter of nine years, and th that's a lot of dollars. So, sorry, Susie. I just, okay. I saw that, so I just needed to remind everybody. Thank you, Dan. All right, so with, with the staff and the general fund, um, a 1% raise will cost about 3.6 million. If we included the staff in ESSER, it would be closer to 4 million. Um, a 2% 7.1, and a 3% is 10.7. So, as Dan was talking about, with flat revenues and increasing cost in other areas, um, building a compensation plan isn't, you know, a, as easy. We showed you back in March what our projected um, deficit would be once everybody comes back, once ESSER is gone and all the staff is back in the general fund. And so, um, we're going to show you a summary of how a compensation plan will impact the general fund further out because then our numbers will look more normalized. Um, the current year and next year will benefit from ESSER paying for those salaries. All right. So here is the proposed compensation plan for 22-23. 2 percent um, for our teachers, librarians, nurses, and counselors. 1% for administrators and 3% for hourly. But this will also include a lot of adjustments for different positions that we're having a hard time filling or that their pay is uh, more out of line with competitors than, than other positions. So um, custodians, bus assistants, bus drivers, special ed assistants, I'm not gonna name all of them, um, food service assistants, those would see a different uh, slightly higher increase when, when compared to the 3%. We also know that the ESSER plan has enough available for a 1% fall retention, and um, we'll be able to reevaluate re that as the year goes on um, to see if there's something available for later on, but we know we definitely have enough for a 1% fall. So in addition to salaries, um, compensation uh, and compensation, health insurance is a big driver for pay. So if you have an expensive health insurance plan, your, your teachers get to, and your staff take home less. So during the 21-22 convocation, a survey was presented to our staff and we had 2,200 respondents who replied that health insurance and benefits were, they valued very important at, at over 92.4% of the respondents. And so you can see here, um, <clears throat> most people working for the district think that health insurance is a critical benefit. Throughout the years, the district has far outpaced our area districts on our contribution to health insurance. In 2021, we were averaging 5,400, whereas the average of our area districts was just over 4,000. That's a $1,400, um, or we're $1,400 higher than the average, or 34.6%. Um, over the last five years, the district has increased by 22.9%, whereas the districts in the area have only increased by 11.4%. So you can see that we've made it a priority over the years. And, um, uh, and we are definitely an outlier when compared to others. Each year we like to take a look at other plans in the area, the ones that look as close to ours. It's very hard um, <coughs> to find plans just like ours because everybody has something different. Um, but these are the ones that we found that, that seem to be um, most in line. And so the, the first column is the most popular plan we have, the low PPO plan. It's an 80-20 plan. And, and here we just have the basic information, the co-pays, the deductibles, and the monthly premiums. And then next to it, we have six peers in the area with somewhat similar plans. And you can see by the, the premium amounts that 
some of the employee only premiums are, are lower and, and better priced than the district. But once you get beyond that, you really see um, employees with Northeast who have dependents on the plan really do save a lot of money. Um, you can see the most expensive plan on there, someone on the employee family plan is paying thirteen fifty two a month for their insurance. And Susie, as a side note, uh, we also have a 9010 plan, as, as you all well know, and I don't know of any other district in Bear County or in this region that has a 9010 plan. So, I mean, that's a very rich plan. It's a really good benefit for employees. Uh, so just, it's not up there. We're just trying to compare to other districts that have 80% plans. Some of them, the most they have is a 70-30 plan, so. Yeah, we've run out of 80-20 plans to compare to now. So, now let's combine that with compensation. So, the compensation um, for a 12-year teacher, uh, Northeast versus these other districts, you can see here that some of them are paying more than Northeast um, and some of them are a little bit less. When you calculate their monthly base pay <clears throat> and compare it, we've got three districts who are, where the teachers are have a higher base pay and three districts where the teachers have a lower base pay than at Northeast. But now let's look at what happens once you start paying for health insurance premiums. So on employee only, you can see um, that Pier A, those employees with Northeast are bringing home $240 more. Pier B, they, they'll take home $68 more on employee only at that district. And you can see that across the way um, for each district listed. But look at what happens as soon as you get to employee child. Then we're basically at, we have more take home, net pay, for our employees and only one district, Pier F, um, the take home is more, but it's only $5 a month for um, the difference in net pay. And then when we get to employee spouse and employee family, then it, it really starts to make a difference in our employees' take home pay. So um, even to the point that it's nearly $1,000 for the Northeast teacher versus the Pier A teacher on the employee family. So now let's look a little bit more closely at the health plan. We thought we'd give you a COVID-19 update. Um, during the plan year 21, the self-funded health plan covered the cost of COVID testing and treatment vaccinations. It cost about $4.2 million. Um, we covered 1.2 million in telehealth. Um, there were waived co-pays and deductibles and co-insurance for COVID-related claims. As of January 1, um, the cost share waiver will only apply to dependents up to the age of 19 and um, COVID-19 testing is still covered at 100% um, for all due to the public health emergency. That was extended through July 11th. So um, we'll, we'll see whenever, if, if that gets re-extended. All right, so let's look at the plan. Our enrollment um, in 2021, was 6635 uh, employees on the plan and 2190 on hospital indemnity. That is for employees who choose not to purchase our health insurance. They receive um, credit for hospitalization, so they'll get paid um, if they end up in the hospital. And so you don't, you don't pay anything for that benefit. Every employee um, is eligible for it, who, who chooses not to take our health insurance. So in 2022, 76% um, of employees took our health insurance, um, 6437, out of um, 8,498 that were eligible. Um, we've been, obviously, <coughs> we don't have as many employees eligible as we, since we don't have as many employees. Um, we also saw growth in the dependents, and so even though employees decreased by 198, dependents increased by 196. So the total members changed by two from one year to the next. All right, so over the years, this is our history of how much the district has contributed to health insurance versus employees. And so you can see back in 1314, we were at 64% district, 
employees, and now we've grown to 71% is funded by the district and 29% by the employees. Costs last year um, increased uh, for about 4.9 million. Most of this um, was in pharmacy, so um, prescription costs are um, growing faster than what our medical costs grow. So they grew 3.1 and medical grew 1.8 million. That's a 7% increase overall. Uh, the medical cost increase was only 3.5%, whereas prescription was 17.6%. And Blue Cross Blue Shield is projecting a 3 to 7% increase in medical and an 8 to 12% increase in pharmacy for 2023. Our health care costs per employee um, has grown since 1617 from 9,000 to 11,600. And as you can see, we tend to have two years about the same, and then two years, and then two years. Um, <clears throat> where does the money go? So of the total spending, uh, the majority of our spending is in um, professional services, so your doctor visits and, and office visits and specialists. 26% is in pharmacy, 20% for inpatient services, then 15% for um, outpatient, and the rest is administrative in, in our, our co-insurance. So let's look at how premiums have changed for the employees over the last few years. Um, 2017, employees saw an increase, but then for four years, um, rates stayed the same. So they had four years with no increases at all, and then last year, they had an increase again. The district contribution increased um, 2017, 18, and then had two years, then it increased in 21, and with no increase last year in 22. For next year, we're proposing no increases to employees with just an increase to the district contribution. And one of the things that isn't shown up there is, is the inflation, I mean, it's the increases every year in medical and in pharmacy. So. Like this year, it was 17%, I think, was pharmacy and 7% for regular. So every year, we're getting hit with increases, and we've always been able to use uh, some of our health fund fund balance and, and uh, the school board able to pitch in uh, without having to raise the rates on the employees. So that's what she was showing, the $30, the $40 uh, that the district continues to contribute uh, as opposed to uh, hitting the employees with an increase. But every year there's increases to health insurance. I mean, if you just look at the newspaper, you see TV, there's, there's, there's always increases every year. There's never any decreases. So we're able to cover them with uh, the help of the school board, uh, increasing the contribution and not having to increase it on the employee side. All right, so how does that translate to um, the income and loss for the fund? Um, the fiscal year, um, July through June, we would see then a loss of $3.38 million. Um, that's adding $2.8 million, um, $2.5 million from the general fund. Um, that's what that increase in the district contribution from um, four eighty seven to five nineteen would cost, and then another three hundred thousand from the other funds. So that would bring our funding to seventy six point three eight million, and then our expected claims funding and and our our costs would be seventy nine point seven six million. So a projected loss of three point three eight. The plan year uh, would be a larger amount, but bear in mind the plan year runs January through December of twenty three, and we would meet again in the middle of that. Um, if any adjustments were needed, so. All right, so fund balance, how, do, how does that impact the health insurance fund overall? So for fiscal 22, we're projecting a $6 million loss. And bear in mind, um, we, we encountered a lot of costs with COVID. And the projection for the, the budget of 23 would be a, a loss of that 3.38 million that we were just talking about. And so, these would bring down fund balance to below two months, um, 1.8. So you start getting into nervous territory once you get below that two, and we would need to be prepared to make adjustments 
um, for the next year if we needed to. So meaning the district might have to contribute more, employees might have to contribute more if plan costs don't improve. If we continue to see the increases, um, large increases without any relief. One of the benefits is that we've had Blue Cross and Blue Shield for 26 years and we just put it, uh, we bid this out and we've been evaluating and we'll bring uh, who the company's gonna be uh, probably come in July. But I think the stability of 26 years, you know, I have a brother and a sister that are teachers and all these fully insured plans, it, it seems like they're always chasing rates. So every three years, every two to three years, they're changing insurance companies. One thing that we've been stable is being self-funded, we, we put out for the network and the network has been Blue Cross. So we manage everything else and that's what tries to, I think that's what we do a good job in trying to keep the cost down. But if it's a fully insured plan, they just put it out and the company says, okay, we're gonna charge you X amount. And then two years later, they bid it out again and it goes to a different company. So that's one of the complaints I hear from people that are school teachers and, and school district employees that it seems like they're always changing insurance companies. And one of the things that we've been stable since 1995, we've had Blue Cross Blue Shield. Now we do bid, bid it out, it's not like they had a 26 year contract. I mean, every few years we bid it out, we bring in the different companies, the Edna's, United Healthcare's, any company that's out there, and we compare what they would charge for different um, uh, processes. And, you know, and, and so it happens that Blue Cross has been able to uh, win those awards. So, but anyway, just wanted to throw that out that we've been stable with Blue Cross Blue Shield for 26 years. And that means when you're not changing providers, you're not changing doctors. So, you know, it, w when you're under one plan, it, your doctor may accept that insurance, but if you're constantly changing, you, you may have a long-term relationship with a doctor who now no longer accepts your insurance, so now you're stuck finding a new physician. So our employees have been able to stick with, as long as their doctor continued to take Blue Cross, they've been able to stick with their physician. All right, so let's talk about Another component to next year's budget, additional allocation requests. So each year, um, staff will, we open up what we call AARs, and they document the need to increase their, their funds. And so departments, campuses will put in a request um, if they see a need for, to spend more next year. And then executive staff goes through, they evaluate it, um, prioritize them, and then ultimately we bring it to you. So let's look at what those requests look like. Um, in total, we've got um, 1.1 million for new requests for next year, um, 67,000 in, in staffing, a million in non-staff ongoing, and then uh, 30,000 for uh, non-staff one year. For the business services division, um, we are expecting increases yet again in property insurance. So we brought the increases last year. We, we're expecting increases again this year. And so a big driver of that is uh, cybersecurity risk. And so the, the policies for cybersecurity, given all of the attacks that education entities have seen, that is really driving up the, the cost of that insurance. Um, Property insurance overall has had a lot of hits over the years. Um, it's, it's not just Texas, but we've had a big hailstorm in 2016. We had the big winter storm, Uri, all these things. Um, and then the fires and things all around the country that drive up the cost of property insurance. And so um, anytime those disasters happen and claims get paid out, you'll see that we'll have to pay more. And we, we have a lot of property to insure. For campus administration, um, we are participating on, with a grant that requires the general fund to contribute some funds to the grant. So a lot of times when grants are awarded, they say we're gonna cover the majority of the cost, but you've gotta cover this piece too. So for this T-class grant, um, it's, it's gonna cost 31,692 um, for the district to do their share. And this is a, a program <coughs> that's designed to create a partnership between the district and an educator preparation program. So this is to establish a year-long teacher residency that um, 
is funded via the implementation of innovative staffing models. I'm reading that really well. <laughs> this is a little technical for the, the numbers people here. But with teacher res residencies, pre-service teacher residents serve as district employees while also completing their year-long um, clinical teaching experience under the supervision of a cooperative teacher. So um, what we're hoping is that this will create a pipeline to, to bring in more teachers and um, establish a relationship with teachers who want, want to stick with the district. All right, under the Division of Instruction, um, we need a, an additional hyper-accelerated math roving teacher. This is a program in the fifth grade where students can take higher level math and so um, we need an additional teacher for, for that program. So this teacher will not be at one campus. We'll, we'll hit multiple campuses to help the students enroll, enrolled in the program. Under operations, um, they, uh, as I'm sure you've seen personally, CPS rates have gone up. And so we expect that to cost at least half a million dollars. And so um, we'll need to add half a million dollars to the utility budget and our um, store water drainage fees from saws will be going up and um, also dumpster and recycling. So we've just been hit hard on the utility budget this year. So 600,000 for, for operations. All right, so now we've talked about all these pieces and let's look at how that impacts the general fund overall. All right, so for 21-22, we're forecasting about 533 million in expenses. Um, and as we've told you, you know, the majority of our costs are in salaries and benefits. So 85% is our projection for 21-22. Our forecast for 22-23 is pretty similar, 84.9% for 539 million. Um, Let's look at what the changes are from one year to the next. And, and as a reminder, we're not including those salaries that are funded from ESSER in both these years. They'll, they'll come back into the district's general fund budget in 23-24. So our preliminary expenditure changes. Um, the compensation plan we showed you earlier costing 8.1 million. Those campus staffing changes of 5.5 million. The district Contribution to health insurance would cost the general fund 2.5 million. Those additional allocation requests for 1.1 million. Um, earlier in the year, we uh, approved increasing the pay rate for substitutes. So we only did it for part of the year. To continue that, we'll need additional funds to, to do that for a full year. So that, that's included in our expenditure changes. Um, back in 2019, uh, the legislature improved, uh, improved, um, they approved uh, rate changes for the contributions for teacher retirement. Um, so we will see increases each year for the next several years. And so it was part of their master plan to get the retirement system better funded than it was. And so We'll, we'll see roughly $400,000 every year for the next few years to, to, to pay for those rate increases to increase our contributions to TRS. We have a whole lot of other little things going in and out, um, changing the, the forecast for next year. And so those all net out and to have a total net change to expenditures of nearly $6 million. Now, how does that impact fund balance? So here's a look at four years, the current year, we're expecting, with the help of the salaries in ESSER, um, to drop $15 million and increase fund balance to 3.7 months. Next year, with all the plans and changes, um, the, in 21-22, remember, TEA gave us some hold harmless for our attendance rate. And so 22-23, we're forecasting a slight improvement in attendance, but not a full recovery to what it used to be because this last six weeks, we didn't see the, the kids coming back and attending at the rate that, that we were used to prior to previous to COVID. So next year's forecast sees an 
increase to fund balance of $3 million, bringing us to 3.8. But 23-24 is when those salaries will come back from ESSER. And you can see it's a dramatic difference. We're also forecasting, you know, changes in revenue and increases in costs. 23-24 um, forecast does not include any compensation plan or any increase to district health insurance. So that is, if things stay the same, we would expect to lose $22 million in 2324 and then 23 million in 2425. Um, our fund balance um, would then change from 3.8 to 3.3 to 2.7 months. So as you can see, um, those ESSER salaries are something that we have to keep in mind. Um, that funding cliff is something that Commissioner Morath and the state have just driven home. Um, so you have to be very aware of it when making decisions because it will obviously, 21-22 um, looks like we're making a lot of money, but the reality is ESSER one-time funds are covering a portion of our operational costs. Well, let's talk about our key takeaways. So, uh, the district contribution rate for health insurance in the proposal will increase. The compensation plan ranges from one to 3%, uh, and it includes targeted adjustments for certain groups that are more out of line. Um, I, I put this bullet on here for cost containment because I figured when you look at a $22 million loss in 23-24, we all realize that is not sustainable. So we will have to tackle um, other avenues of saving money or bringing in money um, to offset that funding cliff that's coming so that we don't just spend all the money. And as a reminder, I'm showing you forecasts tonight. The budget looks much different than the forecast. So you're gonna adopt a budget with a bigger loss than what the forecast is. Because our budget has, we're paying, staff never leave. We pay for 100% salaries all year long. Everybody's here every day and we have no savings from turnover because everybody's here all the time. And everybody spends every penny of their budget. So remember, the budget is like your worst case, and so it's important to, to bear in mind when, you, when you're seeing a forecast, that's what we're expected numbers to actually turn out to be. But to get there, we'll adopt a budget that's bigger because it includes every dollar being spent possible. Okay? So Susie, I guess when we come back and we, you have to approve the budget for next year, the three million dollars that we're forecasting to make, when you when you approve the budget, hopefully, it might be eighteen million dollar deficit that you're going to be approving, or a fifteen million dollar deficit. Um, and we we always do that reminder every year. You know that what you adopt is a little bit a lot more than what is actually forecasted, because like Susie said, it's this is at one hundred percent spent on everything, and we don't. I mean, there's always vacancies and things of that type. So that three mil that you see will be 12 to $50 million deficit. So when you look at 23-24, the budget adoption, it might be like 37 million you're adopting. And we still might lose 22 million. That's, these are actual forecasts that we're trying to get as close. Now that's in the future, you know, there's a, but uh, there's a legislative session next, uh, coming up next year. So things could change, but you know, they didn't do anything for us for eight years, so I'm not sure what they're gonna be able to do for us this come time around. But anyway, just to clarify that, like Susie's gotta remember, what we're showing you is what we think actual is gonna be, not what the budget's gonna be. We're always gonna show you both whenever, as, as we go along, um, but it's just important to, to remember so that you, you don't have that sticker shock when you get it, um, that we do like to budget for every dollar um, including that $3 million contingency I was talking about. Um, it, we, we try not to spend um, those kinds of buckets. And so, but the budget 
has it all being spent. So just something to remember. All right, time for questions. I have questions. I do too. Let me go first. First of all, thank you so much for always having such a thorough presentation and um, covering all aspects. I know this is just session two, <laughs> and we have a lot more to, um, to cover. I do have a, a, a few questions just for clarification, specific clarification. Sure. Um, you mentioned that ADA has not returned to pre-pandemic levels. And Correct. Yeah, we all understand and know that. Um, and that uh, TEA looks at enrollment and ADA. So if it's, you could explain the difference or how they look at enrollment. So most of our funding is ADA. That's where all the big buckets come from. But ADA is a factor of enrollment, right? because it's how many kids you have mm -hmm. and how often they show up. Mm -hmm. So enrollment plays that important role in ADA in that the fewer kids you have, the less there's kids to show up. So um, ADA is a much bigger player in our school funding model. There are a handful of little buckets where they'll say, oh, you have this many kids in this program, but by far majority of funding Average daily attendance. Okay. Um, so you also mentioned that there's a, or will be, a $4.3 million savings due to um, a reduction of 63 um, FTEs of teachers. Mm -hmm. Is that savings um, anticipated to be redirected or... It, what it, are we doing with it's that? It's part savings? of the whole budget. And so, you know, um, some of that savings help offset the cost of a compensation plan or the increase to health insurance. And bear in mind, I forgot to mention this earlier, um, that reduction in teachers, not anybody, we, we have enough people retire each year to more than offset that. So it's not like we are um, handing out pink slips or right, anything. Right. Mm -hmm. It's, it's- um, Attrition the, and- it's, it's people who, exactly. Mm -hmm. it, people who are leaving, and then we can just shuffle. So the same thing with the $2.1 million savings in non-teaching mm -hmm. positions, yes. it's rolled into other parts of the budget, yep. right? Okay. Um, I think you kind of addressed what would it look like, what would the budget look like without ESSA funds? So that was in your one of your last charts with you, you can get a feel for what it would look like because um, 23, 24 start, starts giving you a, a really good feel for what <coughs> things look like without ESSER. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I, I know that on the survey or on the, the chart, uh, the convocation survey, um, a lot of folks said that healthcare I mean, 92% said healthcare was very important. Um, and then we're also hearing that compensation is important as well. And also hearing a need to keep up, in a sense, to keep up with inflation as far as compensation is concerned. How, how do we, I don't know, how do we balance the desire, because I mean, it's a, both is a desire mm -hmm. to, you know, keep up with inflation, and at the same time, keep providing the same level of health benefits that do. So, well, so Miss Williams, do you mind if I jump in? <laughs> Susie, I, I won't, I won't call in. you the wrong name tonight, Miss Lackmore. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, that was the challenge, Miss Williams, and quite frankly, uh, I appreciate the fact that this board has been working on a balanced district scorecard because when we took a look at this, what we tried to do is one of your pieces, right, or staff uh, in the draft is staff and one of it's keeping up with compensation and keeping competitive benefits, but it's also about financial stewardship. And so what we tried to do in working with this is again, as, as Dan was explaining to you, um, 
it's going to be a bigger deficit than what those numbers show mm -hmm. potentially. Um, so what we tried to do is, is to balance them out the best that we could. Um, you know, ultimately, look, uh, you know, I've been pressing poor Dan and Susie now for I don't know how many months to, 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 to work on a compensation package. And, and I said to uh, a group of teachers over at uh, Regency, no matter what I can come up with will never be enough for what they've gone through for two years. It just simply cannot be. Um, but what we tried to do is use that scorecard approach to find some balance in it and not give any one more priority than the other, but to try to do something in both areas. Does that make sense? It does. And so that's the presentation this evening was to try to reach some type of balance between, hey, benefits are important, but we need some compensation too. And, you know, I too, like many of the speakers, have been watching around the, the, the city and watching the state. Um, you know, some of the districts I've seen adopt $58 million deficits. I don't, honestly, I'm still trying to figure out how they're going to get out of it. The only thing I can think of is in some years, if things don't change, that's a reduction in force. That's what they're going to be pushed to, which just means rather than do it through attrition, they'll start letting people go. Um, they also make some huge assumptions, such as zero loss in enrollment. I, I, I don't believe that to be true. And I also don't believe that ADA is going to bounce back next year to, to, to the same levels. So we, again, took some of those stewardship kind of pieces to heart through these discussions and said, look, we got to be practical in this, because we certainly don't want to take care of today's problem and then worry about tomorrow you know, another time, because that's going to have some unintended consequences down the line. So through all of it, that was the struggle, but trying to maintain a balance, like you all said in a scorecard. Uh, okay? Dr. M Dr. Michael, uh, on that same, uh, uh, one of the districts that we were looking at actually posted their uh, study sessions, you know, they're looking at cutting at least 10% from different departments, just across the board. And they showed how much they would save, but they were still adopting a fifty-seven million dollar deficit when their fund balance was only a hundred and twenty. So they're using almost all of Esser. That's what they're saying. They, they're going to use all of Esser to try to balance the budget, but they're going to have to cut a lot of people to try to get to fifty-seven million dollar deficit. On top of um, what was the other thing they were trying to do? Uh, they were trying. They, they were going to give a raise, but it was it was an, a very big raise, and then they made those assumptions where they're going to be flat. And this this district has been losing kids, you know, two three thousand a year. So I, you know, those are, so when we've been looking at different districts and and seeing what they're coming out with and stuff, you know, some have huge fund balances like six and a half months. So, you know, you know, in another two years, they're going to be down to three, you know, districts locally, when we looked at the ones that have actually posted, they kind of only have like, you know, four months or, and, but they're going to be down to less than two after, you know, it, so I'm not sure, you know, what they're posting or what they're doing as far as, are they hoping that the ledge is going to do something or we're going to start getting all these kids back? I don't know, but yeah, I mean, it, it's well, so we research all these districts to try to compare, and it, it just doesn't, they and, don't seem to be and physically. And Williams, what we didn't want to do in the end was to give, so a couple of districts locally have done a pay raise, and um, one I know of has come out with health insurance. So they gave a pay raise and then took about 50% of it in health insurance. What we didn't want to do is give a pay increase and then take it in health. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the balance in it, is trying to, get a win-win there. Thank you. So how, how does the, um, and I'm um, assuming, it, it, again, we probably can't meet that, but how does the proposed pay increase, which I think it was the 1% to 3%, um, compare with inflation? I, I, I don't think we can keep up with inflation. Um, so the current level of I mean, I know gas is, pretty, is now is, like $5. Yeah, so. I filled up at 450 this morning. 
Um, and so, you know, with flat revenues, actually declining revenues, um, you're, you're, you're not given a lot of options to be able to compete when inflation is at a high level. Now, Texas in the past has had some really strange years where inflation it has been flat or actually negative. And so um, <clears throat> we lived for a long time where we didn't have to, um, we, we didn't feel the, the brunt of inflation as much as the rest of the country because Texas has certain industries that help insulate from that. Um, unfortunately, one of those in industries is oil and gas, and so the flip side has happened now, and so um, we're, we're, we're seeing higher rates there um, because of our dependency there. So to, to compete with that, we, we need additional revenue um, from the state. And, and bear in mind, when the state is giving us funding, they have no inflation factor in our funding model whatsoever. So they give us this amount per student, and it doesn't change until they take legislative action to change it. And so they only meet every two years, so you know for certain that it's not gonna change at least for two years. And as Dan was saying earlier, um, they'll go a lot of sessions without touching school funding. So um, that is something that we really need to see in the future is a funding model where the state is giving us increases for inflation so that we can pass that along. And that's a whole nother advocacy that's, that's that we need to work on. That's a whole problem, yes. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I just have a few more. Um, so I noticed that we're covering, we, or we tend to cover um, health care inflation costs, but uh, I think, you know, Dr. Micah answered that because, you know, we don't want to take away the cost that we're covering for health care, even though inflation might make that cost um, go up for the district and then, you know, put it somewhere, to, uh, um, put it in, in staffing and then have to increase or pass along, pass that increase along to the, um, to the staff. So I think you answered that. Do we, do we know how many employees, and maybe we can't find that out, it might be privacy, I don't know, but do we know how many employees utilize the health um, health benefits and maybe it's that number that you said were eligible that 2200 some 74 it's, whatever it is that if didn't I, if I can, it's this slide right here so 76 percent of our employees um, mm -hmm. enroll in our health insurance plan so the the largest uh participation is in our low option so 4700 employees in um, the current plan year participated in that 80-20 plan, and 1,000 employees participated in the 90-10 plan, and then we had 675 employees in our high deductible um, plan. And so 6,400 employees out of an 8,500 uh, eligible employees participated. Okay, I thought there was another number. And below that, we show total membership in the health insurance plan, so that includes the employees and their dependents. So we have 14,000 lives that we cover in our health insurance uh, plans. Okay, I th just thought that was a different slide that showed eligible. Sorry. Um, so d does the budget compensation adjustments <coughs> include transportation? I mean, are, are, are those categories or under non-teaching professionals, or are they under auxiliary? They're auxiliary. Or, okay. So those are, so for instance, transportation would get part of that uh, increase? Yes, so um, hourly employees will see 3% at a minimum, but certain groups will see more as we target to correct, or to, to bring them closer to the, the what we're seeing um, area-wide when we're having targeting those groups that are hard to fill. So bus drivers and bus assistants are included in that group. That'll see a targeted adjustment that's higher, slightly higher than that 3%. Okay. So I think my other two questions were answered. We can't project when ADA would return to pre-pandemic, and um, we're not anticipating, thank goodness, uh, reductions in staff. So thank you.
thanks for indulging all my questions. Yeah, if we could go back to slide eight, and this just, I'd just like to get a little clarification on, uh, maybe from Dr. Michael, on the, the issue of counselor reductions. Um, is that a reduction that, I mean, less counselors? Okay. <laughs> yes and no. <clears throat> so based on the number of students enrolled in a school, there's a reduction in counselors just like there's a reduction in teachers. However, we took a closer look where schools were closer to the cusp of needing to trigger a counselor, and those have been offset through ESSER funding. Okay. Yeah, because I'm very concerned. I mean, teachers, auxiliary, everyone's had a really heavy load these past several years, but counselors in particular, it seems, have really stepped up in massive ways, and to reduce their force just seems short-sighted. Yeah. It's not done in a vacuum. It's truly done by numbers and allocation based on support of kids. And so when we reduce, it's because a school may have lost 150 kids at that school. So that triggers a reduction in a, in a counselor just to be responsible to every campus. But we did offset through some ESSER funding for some campuses to get a counselor back. I'm grateful to see an increase in family specialists, the, the job they've done. I've seen some of the things they've done. It's just amazing. So yes, ma'am. That, that's helpful. But I. I Decrease the number of counselors does concern me, particularly with everything they've had to face just in these last couple of weeks uh, alone. Um, on slide 16, let's see, what's that one called? The compensation comparison. Why was 12-year teacher used as a comparison point instead so of maybe a first year or even a 25-year? That is about the average years of experience of teachers at Northeast have. Okay. How do we compare on first year teachers or first one through five? Can we maybe get some numbers on that just to see? It's, it's fairly similar because you have the same effect because of the rates and, um, but, but yes. Okay. And then on slide 19, the COVID coverage, are we going to be looking at, again, there's no way to, to tell what's going to be happening in September if the numbers go crazy again and whatever. <coughs> Excuse me. But as we um, covered the five days this past year for the teachers that help me remember that, uh, I don't remember the terminology that we used for it, that, that we were covering until, uh, and then we had the was COVID day. leave. Yeah. Are we going to be looking at possibly having to reinstate that if we end up with, and, and how are we gonna cover that if those numbers go crazy again? You know, Miss Hugh, if I had a crystal ball to know if COVID's mm -hmm. gonna come back. Um, you would be so wealthy as I, we I would be, yes. you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I, you know, if it comes back, we will have to sit down and take a look at it. Um, I, I think it's always a possibility. Um, That's what I'm worried about. Okay. But I, I just simply can't. I mean, you know, as Dan and I talked about forecasts and things like that, you can only forecast so many things, and some things you're just never going to hit it right. I mean, right. best case scenario is we return next year and we actually get better attendance rate than than what we're, you know, hoping for. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe our projections are a little bit off and we get a few more kids. I don't know. You know, it, uh, again, I think I've told you all this several times. I was in charge of that area for two years. It was tough then. It's, it's almost impossible now with all the variables that are going on. So it's just something that we'll have to cross when we get there and, and, and see. But can we cover it? I think we could if the time, if, if we get to that point, I think we can make some, some amendments to make some things work. Well, my concern is I know we heard from some teachers this past year that missed that cutoff that we said and that that concerns me that we managed to cover some and, and then missed some yeah miss Huey though I think I said this to y'all it always has to end at I some know. point I know. and I don't know if there's ever I mean somebody no matter when we were going to turn was going to miss out yeah and and um you know it was just one of those decisions that at some point it has to end it, right. and there's never a good time or a bad time there's just a time Okay, um, next on my list. Um, we had a little discussion about the increase in energy costs, but as you mentioned too, we're all seeing massive increases in fuel and and I, I, I don't think transportation a lot from the state has changed since 
<clears throat> the Dark Ages. Um, how, again, crystal ball. Uh, we know the state has a massive rainy day fund that is just growing and growing and growing right now. And again, this, even if they came into session and actually decided to do something, we're not looking at, at anything from them for another two years, like you said. But what about this increase in transportation costs that's so massive that we can't not run our buses? I know some, I know we don't have to. Legally, we're not required to provide transportation, and that's, that's crazy talk. But um, I, I do know that other districts that have had to, to cut their transportation because of increased funding, I don't want to see us go there. I mean, increased expenses. And I know we struggled this past year to even to cover the bus runs that we had, as other districts did too. Um, is there any insight into where transportation costs, or will we be able to get any help on that at all? Yeah, I should have brought a magic eight ball tonight. Um, really? No, I mean, honestly, Miss Huey, I don't know. I, I, I think the thing, so we're coming up uh, here in a few weeks, I'll be meeting with the Bear County delegation along with several other superintendents. One, of course, to talk about safety and security. Mm -hmm. But two uh, are some discussions about this. I actually met with one of our uh, representatives here recently to talk about, you know, they have a lot of um, ESSER funds as well, one-time monies. And so what I, our, a lot of our conversation was spent around what those one-time monies could do. One of those topics I brought up was, hey, you could offset this rise in fuel right now by helping us get through this huge spike until things kind of calm down. They seemed, they were like, well, that's not a bad idea. So I think it's just one of those things that you got to approach them with um, and speak to them because, oh, Dan, I think, and maybe I'm wrong, and Susie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I heard the, the ledge right now is looking at a $25 billion surplus. Yes, sir, that TSA. I mean, it's huge. Yeah. So it's yeah, huge. they're gonna be sitting on a pile and hopefully they'll be able to share it. Right. But, you and, know, and no guarantees so, No guarantees. Yeah. Right, but those are those opportunities, right, that I, I think we can go to um, with targeted asks and um, you know, meeting as uh, all the superintendents in Bear County and with the entire Bear County delegation from the state, I think that's a good place to have that that discussion because I will tell you the, the rise in fuel isn't just hurting us in Texas, it's all over the oh, U.S. Absolutely. Like it's, yeah. it's absolutely um, causing and a mess. Then, and then the, the effects of that too, the transportation costs to even deliver mm -hmm. the food mm -hmm. to our schools yep. and, and everything else. I mean, that, that increases the food cost and so on and so on and so on. But you brought up, uh, first of all, thank you though for bringing that voice to that delegation. That's really important. Um, but you brought up another piece that I had here too, and that was about safety and security. And we have no clue what we're going to be, um, how do I phrase it, uh, requested to to do by the state and the cost will more than likely not be covered if they start putting demands on us for. Yeah, that's the fear of every legislative session is what Absolutely. mandates are they gonna give us that they don't fund, right? No. Um, you know, who knows? Uh, you know, again, I, I, as I explained to one legislator I met with late last week, um, facts, you know, me, uh, myself, and just like everyone else are watching the, the, the news out of Uvalde, right? And facts are not really facts right now. We're all still in the what really went on down there and how can we learn from it and move forward? And so, you know, as I met with that legislator last week, that's their frustration as well. And so we had a really good conversation. It was about an hour long. And, and uh, I said, you know, as we talked about things that would actually help schools, I cautioned him about things that wouldn't. And he was like, you know, I never thought of it that way. And I said, sometimes you all do some things that don't help us. They actually create more of a financial burden. So let's make sure that we have a discussion and that we're doing the right things, just not things. And so, you know, again, very receptive. Um, you know, I promised uh, this legislator when we meet on the 20, I think it's 21st, that I would bring some financials with me to show. So I'll give you, for instance, um, in our campuses, many of our schools have secure entry vestibules. 
All right, we built one in 2019. It cost half a million dollars. Do you know what today's price for that vestibule is? A million. That's how much they've gone up. It, it really is like inflation is hitting everywhere. There are school, uh, there's a school district in the area that is cutting $8 million out of an elementary project because of inflation prices. They cannot build what they said they were going to build. Uh, I met with an, an architect lately. Cost per square footage uh, of, a, of a high school. Gary, you may have to chime in on this. Um, cost per square footage of a high school, I think right now is it, I think it's 600 a square foot or 450 a square. It's astronomical. Oh my gosh. It's astronomical prices. So these are all things that everyone is grappling with and trying to, to negotiate and navigate. I, I, I totally hear that and I totally understand it and get it. But I do think that safety and security still got to be taken care of and a priority because it's, yeah, it's the safety of our students. It's also the safety, as we saw, of our teachers and our staff, too, that's so critical. Um, Just remember, Miss Huey, we spend a lot of money right now on safety and security. Absolutely. And, and you know, I'm a lot of folks of would, would love yeah. for me to tell them everything. But honestly, there's a real balance between being open and transparent and telling the bad guy how to Being circumvent safe. our systems. Exactly. And so we have to be very careful that we're not telling them everything. How to, how to, how to get around those Correct. safeguards. Right, Correct. exactly. Um, and then this is kind of, and, and Dan, you can probably help me out with, um, in the past, uh, you, sh you showed us today three different 1% uh, uh, or the three, whatever. Could, you know, we've had requests from uh, groups from speakers from everything to look at a bigger pay increase of five percent and a minimum raise for the hourlies a, a much higher can we just get a visual of the impact that a raise a five percent increase or a minimum of fifteen dollars an hour would be just a visual some point to see what that would look like yes ma'am maybe at a but, future session okay yeah, yeah we can yeah. do that Easily, but I mean, if you look at, at, at the menu up there, and depending on where you want to do like 5%, all you have to do is just add the 1%, 1%, 1%. One, mm -hmm. one one yeah. uh, that'll help. What's helped us this year with our forecast, though, also is you know, the state held us harmless for the first four, four six weeks. So if it wasn't for that, we were going to have a bigger, we were going to have a deficit. So that, that also helped. But yes, ma'am, we can bring like, uh, four and five and see what it would do to your fund balance down the road because what, what we like showed you um, uh, the last slide for 23-24 that's zero raise zero contribution to health insurance so Susie if you can go to that one right. um, oh, I've been involved in some of those very yes yeah, so, so it, it's, it kind of gets it, it goes kind of quick mm -hmm. so the uh, <laughs> 2324 22 mil uh that's with nothing i mean that's right. we're not doing anything because i mean we wanted to show you what the but yes ma'am we can bring you the yeah i think that's a just important to see items. just to get um just an idea and then i have one question that's triggered by a comment from a speaker just now um in the past and granted it, it could have been i don't know how long ago it was I, and i remember what we used to call it but we did have a budget line item where teachers could get reimbursed for supplies for their classroom. Is that still around? If so, do teachers know that it's available? Is it a line item yep. that we could possibly increase if it's not substantial enough to where we're not having teachers right. pay so much? And, I mean, that's, that's a long history of teachers paying out of their pockets. I mean, that goes back right. decades and decades that teachers have stepped up when the state didn't to cover we're still doing it we've been doing it for years um, okay so for um consumables that they buy supplies uh -huh. um up to 75 dollars and okay um, can that be that's what i'm looking at then can we look at that being increased that's 75 dollars is nothing that's nothing <laughs> so can so we can we get some numbers to see sure. what would be yes ma'am we can yeah that would be great that would be great 
I would I'd appreciate that just yeah. to see if we can get even an idea of, of what teachers are. I mean, I think we probably have an idea of. I'm going to ask As it stands we, for the last few years, we have not seen, um, they haven't used all the funds that we've allocated for it. So um, then we'll, let's look at getting that word out. And, and if we could look at even raising that number, that right there could be a big benefit for some of our teachers. I'd love to see that. And I know what we used to call it because we had a really sweet lady that used to come every year and ask us to please look at raising that number. She's gone now, but yeah, June, June Blum, yeah. So, so thank you, I'd appreciate that. Okay, and that's what I've got. I do. Um, and I was just gonna go through the presentation in order, because it'll- However you want to. It, it, I won't be so scattered with my comments. And some of it's already been asked, but there's some things I'll probably ask again just to confirm. Um, so when we're talking about staffing, um, uh, Ms. Huey brought up the stand counselors. Uh, can, can Mr. Jarrett or Ms. Lackhorn, can one of you explain to me with the stand counselors the moves to Title IV and then one of them says offset by addition of a .8 family specialist? I, to me, a four and a half reduction and a point eight off. That's not necessarily an offset. The that's offsets sort of for the total line. Okay. So, so like, the the first items listed are reductions, and then the last things in addition. I, okay. It's just the verb I used to okay. to transition from decreases to an increase. Okay. I, I guess the more specific question. Thank you for that. But the more specific question gets into this moves to Title Four. I don't I don't understand what that is. So, so <clears throat> Title IV is another funding source that traditionally is used to focus on well-rounded education, which includes technology, counseling, support. We've outsourced that to another organization in the past some, so we're looking to abandon that and use these dollars to support our stand counselors, which have been proven to be successful. I personally have called the principals, verified that they find those stand counselors to be more beneficial to the students on their campuses. Okay, and that's why I think Ms. Lackhorn so, mentioned something about those funds coming from somewhere else right. or just sort of reusing what we already have. So I just wanted to clarify that. So bear in mind, you know, the, the presentation is pretty much from the perspective of the general fund. And so right. these are costs that will leave the general fund and move into another fund. Into source. another fund. Okay. And you mentioned that. I just wanted to yeah, make sure fine. I heard what you, what you said there. Um, and I, and we did talk about the reduction of staff doesn't necessarily mean that we're asking teachers to resign. It's the, it's the f fact that people are retiring and we're just losing people to attrition, unfortunately. Um, when we talk about the, um, I guess, go to the, uh, my, my cut, I think it's slide 11. Um, I guess I wrote it on this slide, but it doesn't, we'll, we, can, we can stay here though. Um, we talk about We've got the huge, the cliff coming with money coming f that we're paying through ESSER that is going to hit us in the next couple of years. How many teachers does that equate to that we're paying that 22 million out of the ESSER fund? Do we know that number? I mean, I know it's not all I teachers. Can, it's not as you, clear as I'm. I can, not I as, can give you a rough a estimate. Rough it, estimate, yeah. It's, it ranges, it's about um, 100 and 40 teachers in total, okay. um, which includes extra staff on the elementary, middle, and secondary campuses. And, and uh, slowly, p different positions will start to start fading out starting next year. Got it. Um, because we don't want to get caught at the last minute with too many positions on the ESSER dollars. Sure. Okay. So staying here on this slide and the next slide, I've got, uh, I guess, a few questions. and. Um, Maybe not even questions, but some of it echoes Miss Huey's request to. I know we can probably extrapolate this by just doing one percent, one percent, and going on out to what a ten percent raise would do. Um, so I guess my questions are, and I. Uh, the first one is that. Um, what does the number look like? Do we do we run a scenario where it's we're not using the midpoint? We're using somebody's actual salary. Do we run that number and compare that to how this looks over over time as well, or does it come out roughly the same yeah. because we're using the midpoint? No. So I will tell you what that does. Shiloh, are you in here? 
We actually did this my first year, and we took a look at it. And, and Shyla, correct me if I'm wrong, but that actually causes more compression. Am I not correct? Is my memory serving me correctly? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. When you base an increase off of someone's actual pay, those at the entry are going to get less of an increase than those you know, at the top, but sure. it builds a compression because you're not moving everyone in the same direction. You're actually compressing your scale. So we did illustrate okay. that with Dr. Mike at one point to kind of show how that would when we actually applied it to pay for incumbents in their positions and according to their current salaries. Is that, is that a simple graphic that we can see just as something to, to look at? I mean, I, I get what you're saying that mm -hmm. if I'm you know, making a dollar an hour versus $10 an hour, um, that's going to be a different amount. Um, if I, you know, do 3% on both of those, it's going to be different for both people. I don't, is I that, I, do, do you have something, Shyla? I think I could put together an illustration Okay. that I could, you know, show based on certain points, not mm -hmm. only for the teacher pay, but for some of our other positions, if you'd like to see that. Yeah. I, and I think, obviously, we're not going to get an 8,000 person spreadsheet and see what that looks like. But mm -hmm. if there's some way to, to illustrate that for us to see, I think that would be helpful. Um, just as a, as a point to, because I do get information, um, from folks in the community, like, okay, mm -hmm. well, you're using the midpoint and what that doesn't help me, but some people it does help, but others yes. maybe not as much as, as, as some others. So, um, I think it'd be helpful to see what that looks like, um, if we can get that. Um, and then I know we've talked about the sort of adjusting some of the hourly rates with some of the folks either in transportation cafeteria workers um, and is that still being developed or do we already have an idea of what those are going to be so those have been presented to Ms. Lackhorn and have been incorporated into the amounts that she's presented this evening okay okay and how is that information then going I guess I mean obviously we have to adopt the budget before we can roll mm -hmm. that out but is there something that we're able to give to people to see what that projection might be? Mr. Byer, I'm going to tell you, it. this targeted compensation is very difficult to explain. I talked with Ms. Uh, Chancellor today about it. it. It's going to be a challenge because some groups get more than that 3% just based solely on fill rates, sure. uh, market values, and things like that. Um, so it's going to be a challenge for us. Um, to explain it to some groups. I just want to clarify, this does not include cafeteria f staff. That, okay. All right. Well, it does not include them. Okay. They are funded out of an entirely different funding different source. Different funding source. Yes, Correct. Sir. Thank you for that clarification because that probably got lost in that discussion. Um, so I was looking at just this kind of 1%, 2 and 3%, and then if you go to the next slide uh, where we actually have the proposed compensation and um, doing some very loose math. I mean, I'm, I'm a landscape architect. I don't do a whole lot of math, but um, looking at some of this, and even if we just bump all these up one percentage point, 3% for teachers, librarians, nurses, counselors, um, you know, 2% for administrators, uh, keep 3%. At, so we, we get up to 3% for most of these and 2% for a, a few of the categories. Um, it was, I think it increased things like $2.8 million total to do that, I mean, just using these numbers on this slide. And so, you know, in my opinion, if you take that and then you run it through, this is where I'm gonna have to jump around a little bit, you run it through some of the, um, what slide was that on? The general fund forecast, we'll just put it there. I mean, we move, we move that fund balance in operating months from, you know, 3.8 to 3.7. You know, now now I know that that goes on the next years. And so that leads to my next question is, so if we kept things flat, why did we not anticipate, like, just use what we did this year and, and use that for the 23-24 the and then 24-25? I mean, because we can make an educated guess that would be sort of a worst-case scenario. Does that make sense? So, so I guess what I heard from you all is that we just kept things flat and we didn't anticipate the health care, we didn't anticipate raises. Right. Uh, for, for 20, for, oh, 23, for 20, 24, 24, 24, right. I mean, 24, we were just 25. trying to give you, I mean, if, if whatever raise you give this year is already incorporated into the next year and the next year and the next year, because it, of course, you, remember, you're raising your expenditures, right? Correct. So that stays constant. Correct. So 
if we were to throw in an extra like two percent, or say we do the same thing we did last uh, this year proposed, if we do it next year, so next year, that's eight million dollars. So your twenty-two million forecast would be thirty million. Okay. If we if we were to do that for that year, but remember it compounds the following year in twenty four twenty five. Correct. So correct. Right. So, so yeah, we just wanted to give you the, I guess the simplest form. I guess in that we can work from that number as opposed to giving you like four percent, five percent. We can work from that number at zero and whatever is decided on next year, whatever we present and how much y'all are willing to accept as far as a deficit. Because that 22 is a forecast of deficit, an actual deficit, not not budgeted, it's it's an actual. Correct. So if you can see in two years, we'll be down to 2.7. So whatever you keep adding, it, that's gonna get to under two, yeah. maybe. So, so then. Because going. if you look at your revenues, I mean, the revenues, we're showing no new revenue. I mean, Correct. It's and, I, and I get that. Um, I guess sort of my next question for that is then what, what, is, our, what is our tolerance and our threshold for that general fund um, that, that we would get down to? And, like, what's recommended? What are, we, what, are we, what are we assuming that we're operating that, using that for? You know, in, um, in the 2000s, and, I mean, ultimately <laughs> it was we just wanted two as months as we can have. And mm -hmm. since 2009, we kind of try to we we we've been actually working to try to get to three months three because months. that's kind of what they say you should kind of have. Okay. Back mm -hmm. in I think we've talked about it, but TARP money back in nine ten, uh, we bought a lot of teachers as opposed to some other districts who <laughs> banked that money. That's why some of these districts have six and a half months, seven sure. months. It's because. Back when they got some federal money back in 2010, they saved that money. Yeah. Here we ended up just spending it. So I think, Ms. Hugh, you've been around when it's been under two months, and slowly but surely in the last 10 years we've been trying to, because we knew I mean, the state wasn't doing anything for us. Right. So we knew that we were going to need a buffer, but that buffer can go really quick unless the state. I mean, I think. Some of these districts, I think they're hoping next year that the ledge is going to do something, or maybe in two more years after that they'll do something. Sure. But if historic, historical, they haven't done anything. I mean, they've actually taken away from us. So it's it's very scary when you start getting below three three months, uh, because if you keep adding to your expenditures without revenues going up, I mean, it, it just starts doubling up, it's and and then it, before long you'll be under two months, and then you'd have to start riffing or doing things to programs. Remember, 87% of our uh, of our budget is salaries. Yes. That, that's well, labor and, intensive. And, and I think from our standpoint, trying to pay for ongoing costs out of our savings account in, in a big way, I mean, look, y you all are the board. You can tell us to do, and we'll, we'll do it. Um, but again, as we start to dwindle those funds, it's going to push us to make some other decisions about, and look, I, I got to have teachers in rooms, and we're going to do, but, um, and, and this is a bad one, but you mentioned it, we legally do not have to provide transportation to students. So you start looking at the legal obligations as to what do we have to do, and that's where you start looking to cut. And so you start w going through, and that's what I was talking about, a riff for some districts that are dipping in and spending, you know, eight, Point, almost a month worth of fund balance to fund their pieces. It's the question is, how are you going to make that up over time? Because as a school district, we can't file bankruptcy. So we're going to have to do some things. And look, we can do it. You can direct me and we'll cut. It's just going to be tough. I just, I mean, we're going to still have to cut anyway, even if we approve this one. We're going to have to look at some cost containment strategies. Um, but we can do it at, you know, whatever you all and I, want. And as the, I'm not asking you to do anything at this oh, yeah. point. So <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know. I, it's one helpful for like us. To, definitely not While we're talking about fund balance, one thing I'd like to clarify is one of the reasons why we need a fund balance yes. is timing of payments. So we get most of our revenue from property tax payments. So you get a lot of payments at one point in time in the year. And then the state makes payments too, but this time of year right now, 
we don't have much revenue coming in the door, right. but yet I still have to pay everybody. And so we really will be paying payroll without money coming in. And there have been districts in the past who operated without a large enough fund balance, and then they had to go to the bank and borrow money in order to make payroll. So that's one of the basic functions of having a fund balance is, sure. is to, to cover you when you don't have the inflow of cash. The money's really not cash coming in, it's reimbursements. Kind of, sort of. The reimbursements from the state? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there was a lot of silence. I thought I'd do something. <laughs> No, that's okay. That's helpful because I think that that to explain what that is and what it's for and what we're using it for and knowing that there is a threshold for this, for our district specifically, that um, we try to maintain is um, I think just letting people know what that is and what it's about is, is helpful. Um, I, I think I go back to wanting to see what some of those other percentage in increases will look like. Um, I really think there's a workable solution in there with maybe it's not 4% across the board, maybe it's not 3% across the board, but I think as you've done now with 1% to 3%, I think there's some, some wiggle room in there that, again, by my, my quick math, just using the numbers on these slides, doesn't appear to put us in a, a, a huge issue um, even even necessarily going forward that I, I mean that I can see but it would be helpful to see some of that projection so um, you know everybody wants everybody wants a big increase and, and I know there's some uh, I mean I worked a job that I didn't get a, a pay increase for five years and so it happens and and I'm not suggesting that we <laughs> propose that um, but it happens and it's reality sometimes unfortunately so um, I think the last, I had one kind of more general note uh, about the, the, the compensation, uh, just sort of the teacher compensation and, and how we compare to other peer districts throughout the area. And I think it goes back to some of the messaging that I believe Ms. Huey brought up or maybe it was Ms. Williams about, you know, do people really, do, 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 do our teachers and staff really understand what that means? Um, and probably more for the new teachers, do they really understand what benefit they're getting from a district that's paying some of their premiums or they're not increasing their premiums for them? They're, they're, they're covering a lot of cost. Um, are we effectively letting our people know um, what that is and what that means? Mr. Byer, I spent two convocations talking about that exact issue. I had slides that showed exactly here's Northeast and here are your peer districts. Um, I've done that twice now out of the three years. So, and as you all know, convocation is when all the teachers are gathered in a room, right? We jump around to all seven high schools. Um, it must have worked because I know several teachers who came up to talk to me and said, I just saved $500 a month because I moved my wife, who's a teacher in X district, to our plan and I'm saving money because of it. Um, if, you know, that might be something I have to do again. I think we've talked about it a lot on kind of repeating a lot of these same messages over and over and over again. I mean, because you can see 60,000 versus 58,000 and then not realize that you're actually And, and Mr. Out. Byer, also the one thing that uh, hopefully our employees will look is the detail, because we, we have a slide on health care, care uh, health plan comparisons, but just for instance, ER co-pays, it's $100 here. Uh, neighboring district is 300, 300, 250, 200. And the other one is a 30% charge. So that means they're, they're on the hook for 30% of whatever that, uh, the same thing with specialty, specialist office visits, it's 35. Neighboring district, 60, 50, 45, 45, 70, and 70. So it's not just that we're covering a lot. <laughs> it's, it's if you look at the details of the plan, there's savings there because, you know, how, how many times does somebody have to go to the emergency room? How many times do you have to see a specialist? Those all, th all those things add up. Add up. So, yeah. anyway. and, and, and Mr. Byer, I'll tell you that there's one district, one of the employees uh, here, uh, wife works in this other district and brought me their high plan. Their high plan's an 80-20. For a family here in Northeast on our 90-10 plan, which is our high plan, it's I think 721 a month, correct? 
in this district, their 80-20, that's their high plan, is 1956 for the for their coverage. There's that much difference. Um, in fact, every year, I get approached by some neighboring school district that asks me to allow them to join our plan. And, and we and always tell them no. Years ago, um, and, years and, ago and, they... And we tell them no because we know our people and we know how to manage it. Adding in others just complicates it. And what you're seeing now with some of these smaller districts, they're entering co-ops, uh, co basically. Five or six districts are coming together to try to lower the cost. But as Dan said, and I worked in a smaller district, um, every two years I had a different health provider, which meant my primary physician might have been in network, and now two years later they're not in network, and you just start going through, and it's, it's, it's a challenge. And that unfortunately happens in the private industry as well. And, and, <laughs> and just so you know, uh, according to Ms. Caldwell, who just sent me a text, that compensation and benefits comparison is also on our HR website. Perfect. That's all I had right now. Thank you. Oh, and, 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 and Mr. Barr, I just wanted to also remind uh, again, I know we just touched base on it, uh, one of the first slides, but remember the, the bottle scenario? where we get more in, in, lo in local, because that's one of the things that keeps popping up is a lot of times uh, individuals are thinking that why aren't, why aren't we uh, paying more, doing more since our property values are going up. And we did this whole deal back in March and we did one two weeks ago, but just as to remind everybody out there that we don't get any more. We get more in, in, in local, the state gives you less. So the bottle is the bottle. It's not, we're not, we're not able to use the increases in the home values of our taxpayers because all, the, all it does is the state gives you less. So just wanted to throw that out because I know social media out there saying, hey, why aren't we doing this, doing this if my property values are, are this, are going through the roof? Well, you know, unfortunate, but the state just gives us less. So just wanted to throw that out as a reminder. I just have a couple of questions. Um, just for the record, I agree with Ms. Dewey and Mr. Byer about the um, seeing the difference with, between the 3%, 4%, and 5%. I'd like to see that as well. Um, what is our starting hourly pay and how competitive is it? It would be different depending on which position you're in. Do we have a baseline minimum? Yeah, Shiloh, can you? There we go. Written from HR. Okay. Are you inquiring about any position in particular? Just baseline. Baseline. Um, well, for we do have different pay families, so just to kind of describe our compensation plan. So we have for our auxiliary, they're on one pay family, instructional assistance, again, based on market and other factors. We look at enrollment and also location, so region 20 and other market factors. Um, but just to kind of give you a sense of that. So for our entry level currently for bus assistance, they are 1056. Um, that is also the pay grade where we have presently our food service assistants and our custodians. Um, for our instructional assistants in the classroom, those would include like pre-K assistants, and those are at 11.75 per hour currently. And our special education assistants, because of the nature of the work, they're in a different pay family, or pay grade, sorry, and they presently start at $13 an hour. We also offer an additional 33 cents um, per hour for assistants that are assigned to a highly, um, a Title I campus, pardon me, because they have to be highly qualified. So that's another incentive on top of their current hourly rate. Um, and bus drivers, um, they start at $15 per hour currently. Thank you. And for um, the survey, do we know what percentage of the staff participated in the survey? It was, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. there were 2,200 respondents to that question. So we had 2,000 respondents out of our 8,500 employees. I, I believe there were 4,000 that participated in the survey, but it just depended on the question, the on how many, whether they responded to the question or not. And so we had 92% say that the health package was important, but only 76% of our employees participate in the health package? Correct. So of the folks that answered that question, 92% of them said it was important. 76% this year took our, our health 
package. In the past, that's been as high as 82. This year with some of the unfilled positions and such, I'm not sure 76, I mean, that's just what we know. I don't know that it's, if we would have had those positions filled, if that number had been higher or not. And do we have any opportunities for the employees to have some sort of creative um, incentive if they don't participate in the health care package? Do they get um, some sort of additional compensation? They don't get an additional compensation, but they do have um, what's available is called the hospital indemnity. So if they end up hospitalized, then they'll get reimbursed for, for <coughs> some of that cost. So if I'm an employee and I have three kids, I'm going to pay a certain dollar amount for my health insurance. But if I'm an employee who chooses not to have the health insurance, there's no incentive for the cost savings that we're getting to influence them to take another plan with their spouse or anything like that. No, we, we, we give everybody a, a minimum of the hospital indemnity and then, um, you know, other than the savings of not having to pay a premium, um, if I'm understanding your question correctly. I, I think you are, but um, so some companies offer um, a stipend. If you don't participate in the health care plan, then you get X dollars a month on your paycheck. Yeah, we don't currently offer Okay. Yeah, the, the the what she was talking about the hospital indemnity. It's two hundred fifty a day that they would get, but they would have to be hospitalized. So, twenty four percent of our employees aren't on our plan. So, that's that's what they would get. But yeah, there's no uh, we don't have like an incentive for people to get off our plan, save some money on that side. And not just save money, but give the employees an right. additional income per se, right? And save money on our plan as well. Okay, and um, for our fleet, so Ms. Huey talked to them about the cost of running the buses and running transportation. Um, how often do we replace our fleet of buses and how efficient are the buses? So it, it takes a bond to replace the buses. So it's not a, a budgeted plan? No, ma'am. That is a very time. expensive venture. So the bus replacement schedule has always been funded through a bond for years. And I don't even know. Um, Bill, I see here. Bill, do you know what a new bus costs today? It's about 110000 110, Okay. That's all I had. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, first off, thanks. We know that this takes an enormous amount of work to give the board options. Um, as several of the trustees have already said, um, I would concur at least a half percent to percent minimum more without putting the district in financial risk, I think is reasonable. But we'll get those numbers uh, across the spectrum up to 5% like Mrs. Huey requested. But um, uh, I appreciate Dr. Mike had mentioned the balanced scorecard that the board's been working on because there's wants and needs and everything. And we do have to balance the stewardship with recruit and retain. Um, and one of those key things though is recruit and retain the teachers and all of the staff that support the student learning. So sometimes I think we need to invest and this is one of those times for us to invest some while balancing it. And that we'll talk more about that later. Um, in particular, one of the questions uh, that ties to the Ed Code in Chapter 11 for trustees. There's the paperwork reduction for school teachers, uh, 11164, and we're supposed to, as a board, review that to make sure that we're minimizing extra workload, and there's been a constant discussion about the teachers. So how do we as the district, or how does the district monitor that, and then how do we as a board get that information, and or has that been monitoring, or what are we transferring to non-instructional staff as required? Are y'all familiar with that one? I mean, oh, I am. I'm just trying to understand how it ties to, to the to the, the compensation and the budget the presentation. Because the teachers are, we just got emails today. Teachers work out. They're getting burned out in okay. extra work and all that stuff. So what are we doing to let them teach and take off all the admin burn? Um, because the, they're considering that as sure. part of their work. Sure, sure. I, I understand that, Mr. Hilliard. What again? 
the, the item tonight is a budget. So I'm trying to understand how that ties to budget. I just don't want us talking okay. outside of our, 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 our piece. Now, if we want to have that discussion, yeah. I can add it to the June 13th board okay. with you guys vote tonight. That's fine. I'm just looking over all the sure. teacher workload is discussion. If we want to continue that conversation on yeah. the 13th, that's great. Um, cause they just want to make sure that we're looking all the ways to let the teachers teach. Cause that's what we've heard. We've all probably, at least I've heard that from some teachers that I know that they want to focus on that and they feel sometimes there's an extra admin burden. Um, the next question is, and I think we've had this conversation, this is probably pointed towards, uh, you, Dr. Mike and the staff, but, um, Discussion about the teacher incentive allotment program from House Bill 3 that helps increase teacher pay. And I think there's a pro we're in that process, but I, I can't remember the specifics on that. I know that's one of those things that can encourage teachers. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. But I don't know if we can get an update on that. Yes, so we are in cohort F, and so we will begin next year in our planning and design with our stakeholders okay. to present a plan. Um, so that will be a very intense um, project. It will involve, again, members of staff, both centrally and at the campus level. Um, and so we will be in preparation of that. Now, will every teacher be eligible to participate, or is it targeted? Because I'm not familiar with the details of the program. So that hasn't been decided yet. Okay. Through the committee, that will be what's determined, um, exactly how many campuses, which campuses, and which teachers within those campuses would be deemed eligible. Okay. And then the range of compensation, is that determined by us as a district, or is that part of that state program? Part of the state program, yes. Okay. And do you know what that range is? I'm sure you know what they're uh, Not off the top of my head, but there is a chart that illustrates that. Um, so as we come forward, we will be making further presentations. We will okay. be illustrating that. So that's yep. forward coming, but that's and, separate yeah. outside of this competition. Mr. Hilliard, just so you know, what it's really based on is Title I campuses and low socioeconomic. Is that the, the for Yes, sir. Okay. So the, the, I guess the, the poorer the school, the, the greater the compensation reward is to work there. Okay. That's how it was designed uh, historically throughout the, the state of Texas and really throughout the country. Um, a lot of teachers, they have a hard time recruiting teachers to Title I schools. So what this was was really about rewarding teachers to go to those schools uh, rather than go to um, a school that's more fluent. Okay. So targeted effort. Yes, okay. sir. Oh, that's great. The other factor is rural. So rural, rural and um, social economic will, will get the highest funding. And um, okay. the, the, but the base amount is, I want to say $3,000 for the okay. minimum. I just, I didn't know, uh, I knew we'd had, it, I'd heard about it and I think we discussed it previously, but didn't know when it was coming online. So thank you for that information. And just there are two parts to that because if there is another district to which a current individual is employed by and they come to us, if they are deemed by that district as one of the three distinctions, they are allowed to maintain that for five years and they carry that to the district that they are employed okay. by. So if they are employed with Northeast and they have that designation, then we would be eligible for those funds and they'd be paid out accordingly. Okay. And that'll be part of our compensation plan to discuss how we would pay out those funds to those deemed eligible. Um, the other is anyone who has a national board certification, they are automatically okay. deemed recognized. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and I, another one, and I appreciate the t discussion of total compensation, which I think is important because of the health benefit piece, because the health costs are skyrocketing, as y'all projected. Um, the question we've been, I think Mr. Byer asked early, for 23 and 24 uh, and the out years, can we do the number, the deficit projection with a 3% or 5%, whatever that realistic number is versus static growth, just so we can look at it as we're looking the possible pay raises and that impact, that, that piece to health care is not going Yes, sir. Going less anytime soon. Right. For anybody. Right. I mean, because we can keep the two and a half that we are contributing or try to estimate what that would be. Um, on the health care side, it's a little harder because it's it kind of fluctuates, but we would have to, uh, I guess, what the district can contribute, include that, and then what potentially the employees would have to contribute as far as. So, I mean, that's a whole different because that would be on this side, but that's also revenue that would come to the health plan to help uh, fund any increases. I think it would just be helpful to have that general projection so we have a ballpark idea of what it looks like with growth versus yes, static. Um, whatever numbers y'all think, as long as we have awareness, that'd be great. Um, this was kind of covered, but for the fuel cost in particular, not only the buses, but all the maintenance vehicles, has that already been costed into the budget for next year? We haven't seen that piece of it so, yet. But obviously it's twice as expensive as it was 18 months ago. Right. Um, we operate the maintenance, I mean, transportation department as a whole. And so um, right now they're seeing, their budget's been hit really hard with two things. One is overtime because mm -hmm. we've had a shortage of drivers and the other is the fuel cost. And so um, with, 
a pay raise for our bus drivers, we would like to see, we would expect to see a decrease in that overtime, which will help offset some of that costs. But yeah, they're included in that $1 million other number. There, there's an increase in there for um, diesel fuel, but we've been paying higher rates for quite a bit of the year already. And so that's already embedded somewhat into the forecast. Okay, so those are just projecting out for the whole next full yeah. year, because obviously and, I don't think it's going to be- And honestly, in, the, in that long range projection, we have a small, in, not a small, but a normal, this is not normal, but a normal increase for those kinds of costs every year. So when we build out long range forecasts, we, we forecast for utilities and fuel costs to, to increase over time because that's historically what they've done. Certainly. Uh, this, this is obviously abnormal, but, it, but some, some of that's already built in there. Okay, so it's factored, that's the key is that it's factored in that bigger piece you can go see it. Um, and uh, Mrs. Hughes cut, touched on earlier too, but um, the school resource officers, I know we're gonna discuss more some of the personnel because there is concerns about that safety and security on campus. Is, is that built into the budget for every campus? Because right now I think we have most campuses, but not all. And, or is that a discussion we're gonna have later? That, that we do not have officers built in at every campus. I've been speaking with um, Chief about that. Um, he's not here, unfortunately, so I'd ask him to speak to it. Um, he does not believe we should have one at every campus for a variety of reasons. Okay. Um, and we can go into that uh, on a different night if you would like. Um, we do have for, so at the high schools, we have a minimum of two. Right. One per middle school and then one per six at elementary. Right. Uh, I did speak with a colleague here locally there at one, eight, one to eight, one to nine. We are looking at a way to drop that from one to six to one to three. Okay. Um, Again, there is a balance, and, and this is the piece. Um, look, I love our officers, and I really do. They, they do a fantastic job. But we have to be careful on if they're at a campus and they have nothing to do, oftentimes they end up in discipline where they absolutely should not be. That puts our officers at risk. It puts the school district at risk. And so there's this fine balance between a presence and making sure those things um, and, and making sure we're not creating a different problem. But we have contingency funds if we need, just like hire extra teachers or whatever. Yes, sir. If, if we made yep. a determination that we that do. was needed, we Again, could. Again, we have $3 million in contingency, okay, and so. that is something we could do okay. um, should you all choose. Yep. Okay, thank you. That's good for that. And then um, back to Mrs. Lander's question, uh, I think several. For those targeted above 3%, not necessarily the numbers, but can we get before the board awareness necessarily which categories are doing just the percentage you're going to increase them by if it's above the three percent currently just mm -hmm. do we have that list mm -hmm. if you can just provide because i mean just so we have awareness i know y'all listed some of the categories but just for awareness for us as we're and, having these further conversations and be aware when you adopt the compensation plan it's very detailed big picture we're not trying to get in the weeds just so we have awareness because yeah. there are certain categories that obviously are going to target above the current Shala, can you share that Yes, sir. You have it, right? I do. So yeah. I just want to, I guess, repeat in case I said anything that y'all didn't catch regarding the current entries and then what the entries would be that we're proposing to target for some of these groups. Um, and then we would be making adjusted adjustments accordingly to the incumbents to move them within the range to avoid some compression. So um, one of the focus groups is bus assistants. Um, just to repeat, they're at 1056. So we'd be looking to bring them up to 1203. Um, our bus drivers are currently at $15 an hour. We'd be looking to bring them up to $15.53. Um, food service assistant, assistance, although they're not part of the general fund, we'd be, they are presently $11.50. Um, we'd be looking to bring them up to $13 an hour. Okay. Instructional assistants um, are currently at $11.75, bringing them up to $12. And then SPED assistants are presently at $13, bringing them up to $14.12. And then we also proposed increasing that highly qualified stipend I mentioned, which is currently $0.33 cents an hour, bumping that up to $0.50 cents an hour. Okay. And I think my last question is all of the, um, I would call like the auxiliary and the aides and the paraprofessionals, they are eligible for health care enrollment with the district. Is that correct? Currently, all of our employees are at least 0.5 or half time and above, and all of those are deemed eligible for Okay, benefits. so they, everybody has access to it if they so choose. Correct. Okay. That's great. I appreciate all the work, and uh, it's always that great balancing act of doing the different mm -hmm. things, making sure we're rewarding our great staff and teachers and being fiscal stewards. So thank you all for everything. Thank you, Madam President. I, I have some questions. It's like, oh joy, right? Okay, I would like to know, what do we budget in 
for hiring new teachers? For example, you have to find them, you have to advertise for them, you have to, you know, what is it per teacher that we have to spend? I don't have an amount of that metric, but we could inquire and look at what we paid in the past school year. So I don't presently have that on hand, but we could look into what that cost is per teacher to employ if you're looking at that cost that you'd like to see. I would like to see that. Okay. Um, the reason why I'm asking for that is if it would be better served, do we have any sort of um, signing bonus for teachers at this time? If they put their, you know, and they want to re-sign with us so we don't lose them because we don't want to lose them. So we have for our bilingual teacher candidates new to the district, we offer currently a $1,000 sign-on bonus to those individuals. Plus, if they are coming 150 miles or more, they get another $1,000. That's presently the only employee group that we give a sign-on bonus to. Um, the retention is kind of that offering that we extend during the year that y'all have approved last year and that we're recommending for the upcoming year that would be to encourage them to maintain their employment with the district. Well, see, I, you know, my whole thing about encouragement is if we're going to, let's say it's the difference between losing that teacher and then suddenly having to spend the money to go out and find a new teacher, would it be, would we not be better served rather than do that, then offer our current teachers a signing bonus like they do in the corporate world. You know, you have a, um, it, it seems to me it would kind of uh, promote some loyalty and they would be looking at it going, oh good, I, you know, I have vacation money or something like that. Well, and that, and Ms. Villarreal, that's kind of what the, the retention mm -hmm. supplement is that we try to do. I mean, it comes at different times of the year. This past year we gave one in the fall and this spring. Mm -hmm. um, and so we try to, if we've got that extra money, it, it I think I understand what you're saying, but it also, we have some of that built into this current pr proposed budget at least, okay, at least one time. Okay. Um, and Excellent. If, yeah. That's what I, I just, I just worry about our teachers. Okay. Now, another thing that, you know, I've been thinking about this because I have a lot of friends that are teachers and one of their biggest complaints is the fact that they're putting out anywhere from 1500 to $2,000 a year, you know, for supplies inside the schools. Now, I'm, you know, that's a big, especially with today's inflation, because that's taking food off of their tables. Is there any possibility, because one of the gripes that they have is the fact that it takes way too long for them to put in a requisition in the office and then have those supplies, you know, come into their classrooms. It takes, you know, it could be weeks. Is there, because I know that um, if we buy in bulk, and I'm sure that we do, it costs us a lot less to supply them with their supplies than it would be for them to go to the HEB and buy their stuff. Is there any way that we can um, somehow make this process faster so um, that it doesn't hit our budget because if we have to ultimately reimburse them anyway, is there a way that we can make that process faster so that the teachers don't have to go out of pocket? Yeah, um, you know, I, I haven't heard that complaint, I guess. And I think when we had discussed that previously, um, if we can find out who these individuals are so that way we can work with them, Usually um, we have a uh, warehouse, right? And mm -hmm. there's a requisition that comes in and we deliver on a pretty uh, frequent basis. So uh, when it says weeks or things that, you know, I, I would need more information as to what they're actually talking about uh, as far as uh, details with that rec that they ordered or whatever they're trying to get from the warehouse. Because we keep supplies at the warehouse. I mean, from paper to pencils to all kinds of things. And we have couriers that go out pretty regularly now we are short at the warehouse as far as warehousemen but you know i haven't we haven't gotten those complaints in, in procurement or we haven't gotten those uh complaints at any at the warehouse about us not being able to deliver or from teachers um telling us that that's one of the things that they're lacking so i mean if we can get better information as to who these folks are maybe there's something in the process that's broken and it's not district-wide it might just be maybe the school uh different bookkeeper different uh person doing the recs because you know there's turnover in the bookkeeper side or uh so yeah i mean 
in the elementary level, the admin assistant is also the bookkeeper. So, you know, if we were to know what school there's this problem, we might be able to address it. But without any more details, from our knowledge, uh, we haven't heard those complaints or, or any of those. I mean, we haven't, you know, uh, we meet every month and I know some of our unions come and talk. That's not one of the complaints that they've put out as far as, hey, what's going on with requisition? So I think we would need more information. I, I, I haven't heard from teacher groups or anybody saying, hey, that, that's, that's one of the issues we needed to look at. Between the warehouse, Office Depot, and Amazon, we have a fairly quick, once the order is placed, delivery turnaround. Um, so, like Dan said, we, we would love to investigate anything that is happening outside of that. Is there any way that we could send out some type of survey? I don't even, what would that cost? Send out, you know, something that anonymously that where people, the teachers feel very comfortable telling us these issues. That way, you know, we can get over the entire district and find out in that way we could narrow down who's having issues, what schools are having issues, and um, because we go directly to the source. Right. Yeah, you know, and one of the things that, I mean, if the teacher doesn't, because principals don't have a problem calling us and, 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 and saying, hey, there's these issues that we're having. So, uh, you know, maybe if the teacher went to the principal or to somebody else. But, yeah, I mean, I guess we could survey teachers and ask them, you know, what are the issues that you might be having? Uh, again, you know, we, it hasn't come to our attention. Uh, and usually we'll hear about different things out there, and that's just something that we, we just haven't come across. Even just sending out an email, that wouldn't right. cost anything. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think that's, that's, that's uh, feasible. I, I, I guess my thing is if they're going to do it anonymously and – Well, we an get, email would be kind of you right. know, I mean, pointless. But, but I guess my thing with even anonymous is if we're trying to root out maybe it's a problem at a campus, if they've anonymous, I'm not sure how I'd find that it's down to the campus, right? If it's a widespread thing, yeah, we're going to find that. But if, if I'm trying to determine is this um, a system-wide – because, again, from teachers I've spoken to – um, to the teacher groups that come in to speak, that's never risen up. So I just wonder if it's not a campus or, or, or a certain area. And we can help with that because, again, it could be simply a new bookkeeper that just doesn't understand the process well, and we need to retrain them. Um, it could be that they've been without one, and we've had a sub going in there. I mean, it could be a lot of different things. Um, so because I'm even trying to think back on that employee survey, if we had a place in there just for them to write some things, and I, I, don't, I can't remember if we did or we didn't, um, but maybe that's something we can add into it and, and put in there, like, you know, please list any concerns that you have regarding these things and see what we can get back, because that is anonymous. We don't know who it is. Well, anonymous, then again, you wouldn't be able to, you know, figure out. So um, I'm just hoping that they'd be willing to say you know if they're having issues because yeah. we want to resolve that yep. we don't want to lose our teachers over be, them being nickel and I mean, dime they, to death. they just need to you know the first thing is is i hope they they talk to their principal and if not i mean uh mr jimenez you've had several teachers talk to your executive directors for campus administration regarding concerns um, because they're out visiting a lot so i'd hope they would just understand look we're going to try to figure out what's going on and try to make it more expeditious for them because we certainly don't want to bog them down in it Awesome. Okay. I'm happy. That's it. Thank you. Did anybody have anything? I have one else? question I completely forgot to bring Dr. Mitchell into this conversation. <laughs> uh, we're talking about fuel prices and energy prices. Are there programs that we're, we can get involved in that would lock in rates or not even lock in rates? I mean, because then if it goes down, then we. But, I mean, do we get bulk rates on things and, and try to work with CPS and SAWS to try to work through? I mean, we're always looking to try to make things more energy efficient and effective. And even, like, with routing, like, they'll, they'll try to make the routes so the buses aren't sitting there idling, so the buses arrive on time, so they can just keep going, so okay. that we can kind of save on fuel that way, maintain the vehicles. So a lot of things like that we have in place. We also look at you know, the air quality and how often are we going to exchange the air and just to make sure that we're trying to keep, you know, our energy cost as, as low as, as possible. Okay. Yeah. I was just, just 
thought of it thinking well, maybe there's with with an organization this size and other school districts if they had different rates that they allowed us to work through um, or ranges but that was it uh, kind of to follow up with that a little bit um, I, I know that it was was the transportation allotment changed at all in the last couple of sessions I don't recall I knew no so since 1982 it has not been changed so we're not, still not we're significantly st enough for yeah, it to matter. Yeah, it, okay, has, it been. has been. So the so state, they did state change. still I, thinks we're back in 1982 so far I, th I think they changed it to 88 <laughs> rates, actually. 88? I think it's 88. Wow. Yeah. They, they did change a few pieces, but as far as dollars, it's not no. impacting us to a significant, you know. They, okay. they're, they're giving us a tiny percentage of what we're spending. Okay, that's what I thought. And, and then just one more comment on the health benefits and I just want to say how grateful I am that this district has done the job that it's done uh, in taking care of our employees that way I would hate to think that someone's afraid to even go to the doctor because they can't afford the coverage so thank you so much for what you've done there to take care of staff appreciate it I just had a couple and I'm not sure if I heard um, Shyla, mm -hmm. um, correctly, uh, when you mentioned, I think bus drivers was going from fifteen dollars an hour to fifteen fifty three to like fifty three cents more. Yes, mm -hmm. oh. that's the entry change. Yes, the entry, entry that's being proposed. Okay, okay, and then for the record. I agree with my colleagues <laughs> <laughs> to see what four to five percent uh, increase would look like. So I was just setting it up for you all to say that so I can agree. With that. I um, okay. Any other questions? <laughs> That's okay. I had a list, but I've got a lot of check marks. But I just wanted to clarify one thing that I and I. I don't think it, I have anything for you, Ms. Witten. Thank you. Um, but if I do, I, I've kind of enjoyed watching you have to kind of get your work your way up there. So, um, Dan, did I hear you say that we're looking at other health insurance companies? Uh, we bid it out. Okay. And uh, we're in the process of picking one. Okay. But I think we've already made our decision. Okay. And will that be brought. known by? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, I mean. It's. I think it's going to the next meeting, right? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm jumping ahead. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. but okay. yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. fine. I mean, I, I okay. just didn't want okay. no, to tip my hat to that's all good. To all those out there still listening. Okay. Okay. Um, and I do have a question. It was the T class, that existing grant. Oh. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, Can you go to that slide? Sure. It was the AARs, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've forgotten where everything is now. It, right there, yeah. it is. Okay, this thirty-one thousand. Um, how many teachers are in that pipeline? Do you know? I yes, mean, fifteen. Okay. Fifteen, and okay. we are hoping to have eight for the upcoming school year, and then the following would be seven. So a total of fifteen over two years. Okay, is what we applied for, uh, and this is just our portion of that grant. Correct. They awarded. Well, we did two parts. Um, it was decision four and five. One was for teacher pipeline. The other was for grow your own. We were awarded okay. four hundred eighty-nine thousand for both. Um, and then part of that calculation, like Ms. Lackhorn said, is we had to compute a formula for the, the indirect cost. Okay. And so that difference is what's reflected here. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry you had to come back up. No worries. Thank you. All right. Are there um, um, one last time? Any other questions? All right. Thank. you. You have something? No, no, I was like, for once, <laughs> for twice. <laughs> Sorry. I'm okay. get, getting silly. All right. Um, thank you so much. Um, it was a great presentation. and But I do have a question, and this is for whoever wants to answer it. We've asked for, you know, the different calculations. Are y'all wanting that? 
prior to the 20th in like an email presentation or do you want it at the 20th because our on the 20th are we approving compensation we would we typically would approve compensation at the same time we adopt the budget. Oh, on the at, 23rd. At a, at a minimum, that's okay. when we have to do it. That's your okay. drop dead. You've mm -hmm. got, you need to approve it, it while, in, while we're adopting the, the budget. Right. In the past, um, and, and here's why we would try to get you to adopt it on that Monday, is because that helps us finalize the budget that you actually are going to approve then. If we're trying to do them together and say, um, you all come up with something else, we're not going to have a final budget for you that evening. So it would be um, my so, suggestion yeah. that we could get that beforehand to be prepared what, to speak what, what to What I was it. going to ask is, um, we haven't done it before, but we could bring it on the 13th next Monday just to show you all some numbers. Yes. Would that work? Yes. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. Okay. That, that would be helpful. Yeah. Then, then we'll bring you some numbers on Monday. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Oh, and I, no, I don't want to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> Item six adjournment and the time is 8.03. <laughs>